Welcome to my presentation. Thank you very much for having me. I'd like to thank the organizers of the Psycholinguistics in Flanders, which this year is in Germany. But of course, I'm presenting from home. Lovely name, eh, here. Where my university is located. So, to the presentation. Sound Symbolism in the Turkish Tongue. By me, Austin Howard. So, sound symbolism. What is it? That's what we're going to approach first. What's the inspiration for this study? How did I design it? What results did I get? Then let's talk about these results. We need to unpack them after all. After that, what, what now? What comes next? And that's where you come in. And that's where your questions and your feedback are so vital for me and for hopefully for the endeavor of approaching some symbolism in the Turkish tongue in the future, should it be me or you. So, sound symbolism, what is this? At the foundation of linguistics, it was sort of decided that signs and signifiers don't really need to have a motivated relationship. That is, there's no reason why tree means tree. The sounds of tree don't indicate to you that it's a tree other than by convention, the fact that in English that means tree. If you speak of German, Baum, Dutch, Baum, uh, Spanish, Arbol, French, Arbre, you name it, right? No particular motivated reason. There can be descent patterns, you know, uh, languages can be related, so French and Spanish, the root is similar, Dutch and German, the root is similar, okay, English is related to uh, German and Dutch, but the word's not the same, okay, conventions change, but it's all sort of conventions. It's not motivated intrinsically or deep from within, right? However, there's the recognition that some words actually may be iconic, and a, a growing number of researchers see this as a fact of world languages, and we now assume that there may be, in any given language, a whole subset of words that are iconic. So what does iconic mean? That means that there's some motivated relationship that isn't just systematic. Uh, for instance, if I say in uh, Japanese, doki doki, um, this means I'm sort of nervous but excited, you know, so there's some positive looking forward to, but also some negative, uh, but it's kind of exciting. That That is said to be the case because doki doki uh, imitates the heartbeat and your heart is beating in a particular way when you say that. This is an example of a mimetic or an idiophone. Depends what you call them. In, in Japanese tradition, it's often mimetics. Many other parts of the world, idiophone, which are a class of marked words that depict sensory imagery. And the pipped there is that it's sort of a painting word. So doki doki is painting a picture somehow of the situation via reference to the copying of the heartbeat and then comes to be conventionalized to mean a, a sort of nervous excitement. So these are an alleged class of non-arbitrary words, of iconic words, and they exist in many world languages. These have been identified through extensive field work, both sort of introspective work, you could say, in Japan, of, oh, we have these in Japanese, what's going on here? But also uh, field work conducted in many languages of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, um, Southeast Asia, um, and also South America, actually, uh, as well. And there have been noted different traditions of describing them, but it boils down to a similar class of words that we can identify as being metics or idiophones. But a new trend would emerge. What was this new trend? Experiment. There was sort of a bridge between field description and later lab work in the form of a gestalt psychologist by the name of Kerler. He went to Tenerife and said, right, I've got these shapes, like you can see here, this amoeboid shape and this jagged shape. Which one's which? He, he named one Maluma and one Tequete, but it was the participant's job to say which one was which. This is now quite well known. In fact, by its later iteration, the Ramachandran and Hubbard 2001 uh, paper calling these shapes Kiki and Booba, respectively. Now, in both experiments, they had a whole host of other shapes, but effectively the idea in both instances and a lot of subsequent lab work uh, has been if people name these shapes in a certain way, 
statistically significantly, there is a non-arbitrary meaning mapping going on. There's a non-arbitrary sound shape correspondence. Uh, now, Ramachandran and Hubbard later take this to, um, they link this to synesthesia, for instance, and say, okay, neurologically what's going on is that it's a similar case to the actual linking of the senses in the brain, and that we have sprinklings of this, everybody. But the original um, Kurler paper didn't go into this, of course, um, but set up, along with its later iterations, the idea that you can test this in a lab, but of course, these are not natural languages. These are not real words, and these don't interact with grammar, nothing of the sort. Parallel tracks of linguistic description in the field and sort of abstracted out lab experiments with a bit of a bridge in the middle, which then later faded away, became these parallel streams within and currents within research. So to various extent, these lab experiments are not so naturalistic. They're well designed, but they're not always well reported exactly how the results are measured, who says what percentages. It's, um, it's a bit of a fuzzy picture sometimes. So what does this say about idiophones? And do either say something about sort of sound symbolism or iconicity in the human mind? What's going on there? So how to bridge these two traditions? My supervisor, Mark Dingemonser, and his colleagues in 2016 conducted an experiment whereby they took 203 idiophones from five real world languages from across the world and gave these idiophones. These Dutch participants were asked to indicate the correct meaning of these idiophones. The experiment was a two-way forced choice task. The researchers also manipulated the prosody and segmental cues of the idiophones, in their words, to try and break iconicity. I set out not to break iconicity, but to test it. Instead of using five languages, I used one, I used Turkish, a language which, to my knowledge, had not been tested before, at least not in a way similar to the way tested in 2016. However, I did not manipulate prosody or segments. Like I said, I was trying to test, not break iconicity in this particular instance. I also thought that it would be nice to give participants four choices, not just two, because then it's not merely a 50-50, ooh, did I get it right or not? It's a lot more layered like this. So, what was my design? Took 50 Turkish idiophones, conducted a pretest in consultation with native Turkish speakers to see if they were indeed consistently used idiophones in the language, and the top 20 became my stimuli. I got 120 native English participants, some of whom were bilingual, multilingual in fact, uh, but none of whom spoke Turkish or a Turkic language. I then gave them this lovely Qualtrics survey. You can see a bit of, a bit of it here. Um, so minus the sound file, by the way. So imagine there's no sound file. You would open the screen here, the idiophone immediately after filling out the initial bit of the survey of, do you speak more than one language, etc. You would come to the screen, boom, idiophone. So you would then get that, get this four, these four options, in this case, expresses a strong taste, mild taste, noisy chattering, low murmuring, etc. You also would uh, be ignorant of the timing bit. I did time them, just in case that would be useful information, but that was not a, a part of the experiment that they saw either. So you had uh, four options, as I say, and these four options were the correct meaning, an opposite meaning, which I came up with, a completely unrelated meaning, which I also came up with, and then, best I could, the opposite of that unrelated meaning. So, correct, incorrect, unrelated, opposite of unrelated. Effectively, that's how I uh, categorized it. So, normally this would be interactive at a real conference, or indeed um, in just a Zoom presentation, but um, I'll pretend I'm going to play this file. Shuck, shuck. So you would hear that. You get to choose at home on your own time 
Which one of these definitions you think is the correct meaning of shak shak? So, what are the chances indeed that you would get that right? This is my overall data, not just shak shak. So you see that actually the correct meaning is quite high. But what does this really tell us? Because you see that there are all sorts of other competing definitions. And not all of them are that low. So actually it looks like this. You can see that chance level is this uh, dotted line. And interestingly enough, over 81% correct answers for bonga bonga, one item. Um, and then very low for uh, jayar jayar. So what's going on here? It might be helpful to go response type by response type. So for correct responses, you can see that some have an enormous number of correct responses and some have very little, but there's a lot that's above chance. In fact, most, so people tend to indicate the correct answer. Okay, so let's look at the opposite as well. You see that actually, towards the bottom, a lot of the opposites are also guessed at quite a high percentage of the, of the correct, sorry. So if you look at the opposites, you see that actually quite a large percentage of the participants also guessed the opposite towards the bottom, right? Look at this, yes, wrap it in foil. Foil one, this is one that has that's not related to either meaning correct or opposite is also uh, around here there's some gray area where people are actually guessing both opposite and correct as well as actually also the foil above chance in some cases quite far above chance and then that's also the case with uh, foil number two so actually, whilst a lot of items are incredibly guessable, or better said, are able to be the correct answers be able, able to be indicated, at the same time, can you truly call something iconic if actually the opposite meaning is also able to be indicated at such a high level? And in fact, actually, can you even call it iconic at all? Is there another underlying reason as to why people are guessing these and actually indicating correct or incorrect responses, etc.? So is it coincidence? The top four actually all have English equivalents. Bangar bangar, pat pat, zong zong, jizzer jizzer. Actually all have relationships with bang, pat, to be zonked out, and to sizzle, respectively. Now, the zonked out one, I'm not so sure. That's not a universal English uh, usage. That's not, um, it's perhaps less common. But the others, I think, are very common words, and they are remarkably similar to, the t to their Turkish counterparts. So is that systematicity? Well, English and Turkish are not related languages. Is it iconicity? Perhaps. Perhaps the same underlying iconic reason generated perhaps the same iconic properties generated words in both languages independently. It could also just be coincidence that through the systematicity of the respective languages, these were sort of churned out, shall we say. And yet, and yet, what explains these competing definitions? Why is it that they are guessed incorrectly and yet indicated in the speaker's minds correctly in these cases? Why is it that a foil or an opposite or, an, or a foil of a, or an opposite of a foil can garner so much, yeah, can be, can be, and yet, why is it that participants indicated what they indicated? 
could there have been in the definitions that I made up somehow a non-arbitrary relationship between the item and the definition I made up? It's possible. I haven't come to a firm conclusion on this yet. If anyone else would like to look at my data and work on it with me, they're more than welcome to because uh, perhaps together two heads will be better than one. Do, 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 do. So this is a summary. This is a written summary of what I just said. We don't know if it's because they're iconic, more or less iconic, what the gradation thereof is, if it's systematicity which goes beyond language family, or indeed if it is just pure chance. And yet, statistically above chance, but is there a chance reason why it's above chance, if you get my drift? So actually, I think there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, but I think it's reasonable to assume that there's some level of shared iconicity being exploited here by these participants to indicate the correct meanings. Of course, English speakers are humans, but they're not human. So is there anything weird about my results? English speakers are humans, but they're not humanity. So English speakers don't represent all speakers of even European languages or even of all weird speakers. So it's perhaps extra weird in a sense. Um, there's within weird variation. A German speaker is not the same as an English speaker. It's not the same as an Italian speaker, etc., etc. Spanish speaker, you name it. We don't even know what weird is. It's Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, but there are lots of border cases of does this count or does this not? Japanese, certain Latin American countries, are you weird within a country? So it would actually be really great to get a much more representative sample not just rely on not just rely on english speakers so what did i even study that's a valid question however i hope that the answer to that would be an attempt to test iconicity in turkish idiophones there's something else i need to bring up i mentioned that some of the participants were multilingual some spoke hindi as well as english even though english was also a native language there are idiophones in hindi and one of them, Jaldi Jaldi, is actually very similar to its Turkish counterpart, Haldar Haldar, in both meaning and form. Could this have influenced results? It's a valid question. More research is needed, as always. I also think it's worth noting that we need to see how idiophones change over time and place, and within families. We know that idiophones can also spread to other languages, but we also know that idiophones are subject to dissent. So other Turkic languages have very similar idiophones, but they're not the same. So we need to look at this perhaps from a cultural evolutionary perspective as well as from a cognitive. And of course, bridge those two because after all, it is human cognition that allows for culture. And perhaps we need to make large giant fields where we look at all of this together in big research projects. The other thing we need to look at would be gestures. So. We know that idiophones are effectively the verbal equivalent of gestures. We also want to know, I would imagine, what do, what semiotic affordances do you get if you are confronted with simultaneously an idiophone, which is said to be iconic, so something allegedly iconic, and perhaps a gesture which could also be iconic or beat, etc. There are some initial observations of idiophone and gesture coupling, but I think they need to be a lot more in the field, of course, but also in the lab and in this way, bridging them. So you could, for instance, you could test iconicity of idiophone, of co-idiophone gestures. You could give non-Turkish speakers the gesture and they could produce the idiophone and you could do lots of different combinations of this and come up with some nice experiments. But I think that's a direction that we need to go. And of course, I'd be happy to do that. I have some references. Um, please check them out. There are lots more available. And I thank you for your attention. Many people have helped me along the way, and they've been very kind, as have you for listening to this presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions, and I look forward to seeing you live at another conference. Take care.